The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hello, body. Hello, hello. Body, what's going on? Pe- people are excited. Okay. Man. B- body always has the greatest analysis. All right. <laughs> yeah, I've been on Reddit for a long time. I uh, share a lot of charts and stuff. So, uh, all right, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, all right, here's the chart that uh, you know everybody really wants to see go up more than anything. Uh, lifetime chart. You know, we um, we broke down through this thing uh, through this. Uh, this wedge or this rising triangle. Um, I don't like having broken down from that, but um, you could see these, these areas here that we're kind of sitting at. This is uh, fairly prominent for um, a big portion of uh, Monero's lifetime. Here's the SMA ribbons or the SMA bands. Um, they look kind of cool. Um, I have like filtering going on, so you, you would actually there would be a lot more here going on with these bands. But essentially, these are all just um, different time frame moving averages. So you can see we're basically just kind of trending in in between, um, you know, our recent our recent highs from last year. Um, so like, you know, this really isn't the kind of price action we would hope to see. You know, we want to be a lot higher, but at the same time, I mean, Monero's price has shown itself to be quite stable. Uh, you know, we crashed down here back in June, but we come up and we've kind of just been holding steady. Um, let's see. We've got also the uh, the fractal here that <clears throat> unfortunately it's hasn't played out like we hoped. Um, but the other thing, too, is that we need it's not just going to happen magically. It's not just going to like suddenly break out. We need some kind of um, something to, to drive that. Like, for example, the Mt. Gox Bitcoin. Um, so it's looking like they're getting closer and closer. It's always really slow process. Um, but people are saying maybe early next year now. It, it's hard to say because the Mt. Gox trustee has, has not been known for how quickly he moves. Um, so anyways, this is, uh, this is basically that fractal from, uh, way back, way back in 2015, 2016. And, uh, you know, I played with this as much as I can. And, and this is really about the most that we can extend this. Like we really, you know, okay, maybe we could try and, and stretch it some more, but that, that's really not, uh, you know, that, that's really taking it too far. So, um, you know, a little bit bummed that that didn't come out uh, as well as we might have hoped, but uh, yeah, that would have been, uh, you nice. know, that would have been nice. Yeah, yeah, that would have been a big, uh, a big boost to the pocketbook, right? We go, go buy our toys and dark net stuff or whatever, buy our dark net dairy milk. For those, <laughs> for those listening, um, you know, des- describe you know this this potential event you're talking about. You're talking about when they when they give the they they're holding on to a lot of coins that need to be released. Oh yeah, so um, back in uh, 2013 2014, one of the big drivers of that bull market was uh, was Mt. Gox. There was basically no other exchanges except for Mt. Gox, and really they started out as like um like a game token or like they sold a bunch of stuff related to uh, online. Uh, video games like World of Warcraft and, and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, they blew up really big with Bitcoin. And the problem was that they were operating these bots. They called them the Willy bots. And essentially, these Willy bots were allowed to buy Bitcoin with dollars that they didn't actually have, um, which which massively drove the price of Bitcoin up. And then um, allegedly they got hacked, but a lot of people suspected that, you know, it might have been an inside job. And essentially, they drained all the Bitcoin, um, and then there was no money. There was no Bitcoin. There was no dollars, nothing to pay people out with. So they collapsed and went bankrupt. Um, well, some of those Bitcoin were recovered. Um, something like, uh, I think it was maybe 200,000 Bitcoin. They, they sold a whole bunch of them. So right now they have about 141,000 Bitcoin. Um, and those have been in limbo for eight years now. And there was this whole process that, that had to happen with the Japanese, um, with, through the Japanese courts to uh, rehabilitate some of the victims. Um, so you have all these people that have claims with Mt. Gox and you have 141,000 Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash that Mt. Gox is going to sell off or sorry, uh, is going to, um, uh, I guess, repatriate to people that, that lost them. And people can choose to take that in fiat or they can choose to take it uh, in crypto. Part of it does have to get paid out in fiat regardless of what you want. But essentially what it represents is a significant amount of Bitcoin um, sitting on the books that people are going to get back. So This could be a negative price event for Bitcoin. Um, It could be a negative price event for crypto in general. But in a situation like we have with Monero, where the exchanges already have so little of it, 
it really takes only just a fraction of that Gox coin converting into Monero it could potentially cause a big price spike. Um, like right now, Monero's, um, Monero's Monero to Bitcoin, uh, the market caps are, it's about 0.7 or uh, yeah, 0.7%. Um, Monero has about 0.7% of Bitcoin's market cap. And, you know, so you imagine, okay, well, maybe about half a percent, 1% of that Gox coin chooses to convert into Monero. It doesn't sound like much, but um, but it's quite a lot of money. And um, at the ratios that we have, we could be looking at anywhere between 20, 50, 100,000 uh, Monero being bought when these coins get released. Um, there's other, like some some smart people have got on Reddit and helped me to understand that, uh, you know, I'm really, in some ways I'm oversimplifying the situation and a lot of people have already had the opportunity to sell if they wanted to. So this might not be quite as negative a price event as we originally thought, but it does still seem like there's there's potential there. Um, but it's moving very slowly, so it's hard to it's hard to say for sure. But uh, you know, one can hope. All right. So, uh, any uh, any questions with the Mt. Gox uh, coin? No, or... no, no, no. I mean, uh, whatever happened to that guy Carpel? So I'm like, I haven't been following it. Oh yeah, um, he's out of jail, and uh, he <laughs> earlier this year he said uh, maybe his his timeline was maybe August or September, but. You know, he's not the so Mark Carpellis was the um, uh, I believe he was the CEO of Mt. Gox. So yeah. he went to jail for a period of time, but uh, he's out now. And I don't know, somehow he's still I don't know if he's involved or or what. He's it seems like, like he's like, like one still of the first evil, evil characters of, of crypto. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I, I've heard different stories. You know, it might have been that he just kind of got in over his head. Um, didn't really know what he was doing. Yeah, that could yeah. Be possible. Yeah, it was amazing He's, when you know at the time he re it really served a purpose, right? Like, yeah, granted it, it ended up being a scam, but um, it was right. Was it, it was kind of really the first exchange that that got Bitcoin out there, right? Yeah, yeah. There was a, a lot of um, big things that happened during that time for sure. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting it's, like, what you're saying too, because there is a chance that some of these people who have their Bitcoin locked up. Uh, have since you know discovered Monero. I mean, they're they're old school Bitcoiners, so they they might be of of the archetype that believes in true digital cash. Yeah, I think that's definitely could be the case. Um, you know, you're talking about OG uh, Bitcoiners, cryptocurrency people, and it seems like the OGs, you know, they've had more time to discover, explore, and and a lot of them have discovered and found Monero. Uh, pretty much all of us were, most of us were Bitcoiners. Um, years ago and then we figured that you know we found Monero and, and realized that it's has many superior qualities okay. so um I'm, I'm on different so I, i'm yeah, yeah can you all see my screen yes i'm just trying to make sure okay i was just looking at the uh youtube and I, maybe my youtube is delayed okay so um yeah that's the Monero bitcoin ratio here um essentially we broke out of this very large uh lifetime sideways triangle which is nice, you know, at least we broke one of the triangles <laughs> since since we didn't get this one here. Um, so, uh, you know, so far price has just been uh, relentlessly wanting to stay high. Like I imagine that if the price, if they could push this um, this ratio lower, th they would. The one thing that maybe if they do push the ratio lower, it'll be probably on the back of um, pumping the entire crypto market. You know, they've got the tether printing machine or they've got their little ways and means of pumping the market. Um, and they pretty much choose not to put that into Monero for the most part. Um, so here's a chart that uh, I look at um, fairly often. This is the ratio of um, the price on Kraken versus different exchanges. Um, let's see, the white line is aggregate, so let me remove that. Okay, so the red line is Binance. Uh, the yellow line is uh, Qcoin. Green is Bitfinex and then blue is Poloniex. So there's there's kind of two ways you can look at this. Uh, the first one would be to just look at the ratio, like just the pure ratio. Um, and this is in percent. So these are like, this is very small. This is like 0.1%, which really is nothing. Um, and this is the kind of action that you would expect to see on on any chart on an honest set of exchanges. Um, the, the difference between Kraken's price and all the other prices should basically be very close to zero and just oscillate. Um, but if we go back further in time, we can see that there was period of time, periods of time where that, um, that definitely wasn't the case. Uh, let me see if I can get further back. Here we go. 
for example, when Binance shut down withdrawals um, back in August, when the rest of the crypto market was pumping and peaking, uh, in fact, we can add total onto this. Uh, we can we can just get a feel for how uh, that didn't work. It's weird. Let's try that one more time. Hmm. All right. Well, my charts don't want to work for some reason, but oh, here we go. That's why. Uh, okay. All right. So the blue line is total on top. And you can see that essentially um, as price was going up uh, here in August, um, they essentially diverged Monero's price downward by about on average one and a half percent, two percent. But this is just taken at the end of the candle close. So all of that intra action, like the intra candle action on the second by second time frames, um, you know, these are 15 minute candles. So we're not really capturing all of that. So the divergence is actually a little bit more um, than it appears. Uh, so let's go back to the five minute chart. Yeah, I try to look at this um, on the five minute chart because it's a much more fine grain uh, picture. So the, the smaller that you make the candles, like if you made them one second or five second candles, you would really get a much better picture of how um, that price divergence is behaving. Uh, but essentially, whenever Binance turns off withdrawals for any uh, length of time, we see price divergence. Um, so lately, they haven't been too bad. But there is one more way that I like to look at this. Um, so this is just like the raw number of, of dividing who, you know, Kraken's price, uh, or sorry, dividing Binance's price or other exchanges price by K Kraken. But the other thing I do is I multiply it by volume. Um, because if you have, let's suppose you have a 10% price divergence, but nobody bought or sold any coins at that price, does it really matter, right? It didn't really, it didn't really affect anything. So what I do is I multiply it by the volume to see, um, you know, how that, how that might, um, you know, what kind of real volume was done at that price, because that represents real, hopefully represents some amount of real economic energy. Um, so you, you'll notice that the chart changes significantly when we do that. Um, interestingly enough, here in the middle of October, um, they actually did a lot of volume at, um, at a slight uh, higher price divergence. And um, if we look at the Monero price, it's interesting because you, you can see how that, that does kind of affect the price. We had positive movement um, through that. Um, and then right here, so price crashed, and then they diverged the price upwards again. Lately, we've been on a slight negative um, divergence from Kraken. Uh, so, you know, it's, I guess that's not too surprising. It seems like the rest of the crypto market is pumping. And you'll notice that, you know, on very small time frames, let's go to the four hour. You know, we'll no you'll notice that we've kind of been dropping uh, when the rest of crypto has been pumping. Uh, if you if you really want to see something that's uh, that's I don't know disconcerting, <laughs> disgusting. This is Dogecoin. Uh, Dogecoin today just did like this is on the daily candles. Dogecoin just did a 75 percent pump here in like the last four hours. Um, I guess it's because Elon Musk bought Twitter, and so yeah. people are. That's that's the main thing I could think of to for yeah, for why that would be the case. Definitely why. Uh, there's another chart I look at that. Um, so this is all, these are like different cryptos related to each other. And it's kind of like, it, it's a way of looking at their relative price movements um, all on the same axis. Because, you know, if you try to put Dogecoin's price next to Monero's price next to Bitcoin's price, the axis is all messed up. And then you have to like, you have to drag the, the candles and you have to like compress them or squish them. And, and it's hard to know like really what's appropriate. So um, this is based on something called Z-scores, which is standard deviation. So... Um, I'm looking backwards here uh, on about 500 candles. We're on the one hour. So this is, we're looking back 500 hours. So basically, what was the average volatility and prices of the past 500 hours? And um, how is it moving relative to that? So you can see like Dogecoin is just massively taken off there. Uh, and then I do the same thing for um, very broad markets. So purple is cryptocurrency. Blue is the stock market. Yellow is gold. The gray is silver. Green is the Dixie. And then red is... Um, uh, red is the bond market, like the aggregate value of the bond market. And so you can see that lately crypto is really, uh, really pumped significantly relative to everything else. But the stock market's pumping a little bit, too. Um, so the the thing is that um, it looks to me like they're probably putting a floor on this market and they've been doing it for the past month. Um, I really thought, you know, for quite a while, I held on to the uh, crash in October thesis, 13K October. Um, but I've pretty much taken that off the table now. And 
essentially for, for a long time, what I said is, especially since the middle of August, I said, okay, this is the top. We're going to go down now. Um, and we're probably going to crash in October. And I kept saying the only thing that could save us from crashing would be central bank or government intervention, because there's just nothing left to support these markets. Well, that's exactly what we got. And, um, you know, if you're trading, it's really a good idea to have falsification criteria. Like you want to have a thesis, um, an idea, you know, your hypothesis of what the market is doing. Uh, and then you kind of want to trade off of that hypothesis as a broad picture. But then you also want falsification criteria to say, okay, how do I, how will I know when I'm wrong? Um, and in this case, for me, that was, um, I was saying, if we see central bank intervention, if we see government intervention, that's, that's a big sign that, um, that the market might do something that I, that I didn't expect. So, um, and then you can see here that here's the price of uh, the chart of Bitcoin. And so we have the Bank of England. They restarted QE for a few weeks. I think they're ending that like next week or maybe they already ended it. They're, they're about to end their purchases of bonds. Essentially, the, the UK bond market was on the verge of I don't know if it was on the verge of collapse or if it was it was really, really problematic. Um, so the Bank of England um, decided that they would start purchasing those bonds outright to prevent um, the bonds mark, the bond market from uh, fracturing, as they called it. So um, you can see that that happened like at the very bottom right here. Uh, this this structure right here is a very common structure of crash. Essentially, you come down, you make a big pump up, and then you retrace all of it very quickly. And usually that means that you would crash down. Um, but in this case, you can see the Bank of England basically came out and kind of kind of saved the markets right there. Um, and then uh, right here at this candle, the United, the United Nations said, hey, uh, United States Central Bank, y'all are being, Federal Reserve, y'all are being imprudent. Um, and you're jeopardizing the global economy. So we pumped right after that. But apparently even these two things weren't enough because again, the market was still like on the verge of crashing. We still kept going down. And then finally, last week on Friday, um, this Fred, uh, Fed president came out and they, she started talking about how they're, maybe they're going to pause uh, the rate hikes. Maybe they're, they're going to take it easy. Um, and then there was also this other guy called the Fed Whisper. I've never heard of him before, but apparently he's yeah, like popular and then TradFi, but he was like, yeah, they're, they're going to pivot soon. And that was like, <laughs> that was at the candle open right here. That was at the daily open. So, you know, you can see that their interventions have kind of put a floor on these markets. And it seems difficult to believe that they would just do that for no reason, that they, that they would just now suddenly the market will, will just crash. The other thing is that um, this vertical line right here, um, that's the Fed meeting next week. And then here's the U.S. elections um, on November 9th. So I think at a minimum, we can probably expect to, to um, keep reasonably strong action um, on both stocks and crypto all the way through the election. Uh, let's see. Here's another chart that I oh, go ahead. What do you think the, the interest rate is, you know, uh, the amount that they're going to uptick it by? Um, I think it's I think uh, 75 percent or 75 basis points is what the market has priced in. Yeah. Um, but the, the real the real thing that people will be looking for and personally I'll be looking for because I really am probably about to get long the market again. I, I mean, I have a Monero hodl that I just you know I keep around because uh, sometimes you need digital freedom money. Um, but, you know, with the rest of my stack, I'm kind of just chilling in stable coins and gold, silver. Um, so I am looking to maybe rebuy, get long the market here, at least for a swing trade, because what what the market is going to be looking at uh, on the Fed meeting is not not necessarily how much they raise this week, the 75 basis points. Um, it's going to be their forward guidance because people have been talking about a Fed pivot or the Fed's going to pause. Their last meeting, that's what the Fed said. They said, "Hey, we're we're you know we'll probably raise 125 basis points through the end of the year, and then you know we'll it might be appropriate to pause the rate hikes and see what kind of effect that has on the economy." And um, you know, the reality is that uh, pretty much since 2000, since the dot com crash. The market has become more and more reliant on um, on central bank policy, and then especially with 2008 when they when they came up with quantitative easing, which is just code for we're going to print a bunch of money and buy a bunch of toxic assets to make sure the market doesn't collapse. Um, you know, in, in the past, there was times where the Fed could raise rates and the money supply, the M2SL money supply could be contracting and we would still see stock market gains. Uh, but that was when interest rates were five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Um, the thing is that the market and the kind of regime and profile that we're in now, the market is just heavily, heavily reliant on um, expansionary central bank policy. So, um, you know, and especially people have become much more forward looking about that. Um, so we're kind of in, living in a different game now than it was back in the 80s and 90s. 
So, um, you know, the market is like, the market is almost giddy over the fact that the Fed might pause rate hikes. Um, so that will definitely, it should, I shouldn't say definitely, right? Who knows? Uh, but it should cause, it should cause a pretty big um, rally here. Now, the real question is, will that rally die? Will it fade right. after the elections? I would think that they probably wouldn't, the market wouldn't just crash, you know, on November 10th. Um, cause then that becomes too obvious. So probably we'll get a decent rally at least through December. Uh, but the real question becomes what happens next year? Okay. Maybe the fed pauses, but are they going to be able to lower rates? Are they going to be able to restart QE? Cause they're still selling off their balance sheet. Um, so then the question becomes next year, well, what happens when the market realizes that the fed might not lower rates at all? Um, are we going to retrace? Are we going to give that back? Which is why I think that we're probably in for, this is a longer ordeal than people realize. Like a lot of people think, oh, this is the bottom. And maybe it is a temporary bottom for quite a few months. Um, and maybe it is like the full bottom. That, that could be the case. But um, it's just, you know, it's good to be careful. It's good to be cautious right here. Um, because like, for example, the 2008 crisis, that unfolded over the course of like a year and a half. So we're, we're really not out of the woods yet, even historically. Um, there are some good signs, though, that things are turning around. So... What I'll show you here is uh, Dixie, and Dixie is just the relative value of um, the United States dollar to the euro, uh, a combination of the euro, Great British Crown, Japanese yen, Swedish franc, Canadian dollar, and um, I think maybe the Aussie as well. I don't remember. But anyways, um, the thing is that like the dollar has been falling in absolute terms because inflation is so high, but in relative terms, it's been performing very well um, to pretty much all of the other currencies. And the thing that, that people, um, people tend to miss or, or people tend to get wrong is that, it, okay, like it is true that the dollar has been falling in value in an absolute sense, but the Dixie gives us a picture of relative funds flows because the dollar is kind of a place of strength that people go to um, when there's times of trouble. So people in the European markets, for example, will, will leave the euro, they'll leave a lot of European investments, and then they'll just buy dollars. So it's not so much that the Dixie is saying how strong the dollar is um, in an absolute sense. It just gives you an indication of, of how fun, uh, funds are flowing. So um, one thing I've been looking at for pretty much this entire bear market is, um, so this is on the monthly charts right here. Okay, so right here is um, the summer, last year in the summer. And uh, hang on one second. I drawing. There we go. Okay, so right here is was in the summer, and then this has basically been the entire uh, bear market with with the dollar rising. And the same thing kind of happened um, in the last bear market as well. Uh, so here's, uh, yeah, so here's um, 2017, and essentially the Dixie was rising for pretty much most of the bear market last time. Okay, so what we're looking at here is these blue bands and these purple bands. Um, the blue bands are the, uh, the standard deviation. And then the purple bands are kind of like a derivative of that. It's not the second standard deviation. Um, it's a non-arbitrary, you know, so usually the second standard deviation would just be multiplied by two on the first standard deviation. It's really more of an iteration on it. It's, it's not, um, there's not an arbitrary multiplication factor, but anyways, um, so in the dot, the dot com bubble, essentially you can see that we, we got right into the zone here. And this is kind of where I've been expecting to get the entire time for us to finally have the potential to reverse. So um, this is it's really not surprising that the Dixie is starting to pull back here. Um, I think that there will still be more strength. I mean, the Fed is, again, they're still going to raise 75 basis points, and that's going to take time to filter into the economy. And maybe even December, they might raise again. So um, we'll still probably be flirting with this area up here for some period of time. But we're finally in the zone where we might expect to see a reversal. Uh, so that's good because that, that gives us the indication that crypto um, could probably – at least get a big rally as well. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll show you guys today is um, this is reverse repos. Um, I recently started looking at reverse repos because what it is is um, financial institutions putting money with the Federal Reserve overnight, and they get some very small um, interest rate or small yield for keeping their funds with the Fed overnight. Now, essentially, to me, what this represents is latent economic energy. Um, essentially, people that that have liquid cash, they want to keep it liquid, um, but they don't. Uh, they're they're not confident to to buy anything with it, so they're basically just waiting. Uh, you can see back here, this is 2021. Um, right here's Bitcoin's peak right in April, and then you could see these reverse repos just continued rising. Right now, there's 2.8 trillion dollars. Sorry, 2.18 trillion dollars um, being held overnight with the Fed. That's quite a lot of money. 
Um, and it's not doing anything. It's really, it's just people looking for, for yield. So, um, yeah, to me, to me, this, um, when we start to see this go down, that's probably a sign that, um, we're, we're going to start to get some more long-term reversal. Uh, but for the meantime, you know, it still remains relatively high. Uh, so yeah, that was a new one for me. I, I thought that the reverse repos are, were pretty cool. Um, but you know, that's, that's probably good enough for today. I, I could sit here and talk. Yeah. For we we could go on hours. forever, <laughs> man, forever, but just, just one general, uh, how about this, you know, the scenario, do you think there's a scenario where, you know, the fed at the next meeting, uh, you know, maybe they do 75 basis points, but then they, they forecast, you know, uh, even, you know, stronger news that they're that the, the, the fight against inflation continues, you know, and like they, they give kind of a more doom and gloom in terms of we have to we're, we're staying steadfast with, you know, raising interest rates to fight inflation. Inflation really isn't getting any better. Do you think that could pound the market back down? There's a scenario there. Yeah, there's there's definitely the risk of that. I don't I don't I think mean, that's, that's what been, they're going to do in their tone so far. They've been very black yeah. and white about it, right? Yeah, I think that's why the Fred, when Fred, Fed President Daly came out, I think that's why she had such a big effect because um, the Fed has been so hawkish for, for the past year. Uh, and finally, at least one of them came out and said something that wasn't totally hawkish. Um, but yeah, there, there is that danger. The GDP numbers last week were pretty good. Um, we, uh, it was actually increased more than people were expecting. But on the other hand, that means that it might give the Fed confidence to say, well, GDP was great. Let's keep raising rates. Um, exactly. You know, the economy apparently yeah. is doing fine. Right, right, right. So, right. so there is that danger. It, it could totally happen. Yeah, the, the economy is doing too well. And so they're, they're <laughs> to, to pound it down. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, man. But amazing analysis. Uh, we could go on forever. Uh, and you'll be back next week doing it again, right? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've got I've got a whole bunch of stuff I'll show you guys over over the course of time and we can we can dive deeper into. Yeah, we're we're uh we're leaning Mexico, man, uh for Monerotopia. <laughs> oh yeah. You guys uh I'll meet you guys in Mexico City in a couple weeks. That'd be oh, fun. Oh nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Oh cool. I don't know all about right. that. <laughs> awesome. Good stuff. Um all right, yeah, let's uh, let's let's keep it going. Guess, yeah, let's keep going. We have uh Tony with the news, my friend. Thank you, Body. Body, hang around if you if you like. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we're moving on. We're moving on. All right, guys. Thanks. All right, All right thanks. Cheers. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.